Actually, my gym membership became useless the second I transformed into a gorilla. My gym has a prominent no gorilla rule. And believe me, it was very strictly enforced. It's the conversation. Welcome to it. I'm Heil Russell, doing the welcoming, but also doing the welcoming is this person over here. Cameron, hi. Welcome, also. In five years, computer algorithms can do this for us. Either, you know, it, it's, it's going to be great. We can just sit back and we can have AI, Heil, AI Cameron, AI Joe Mudd, AI Nick Prohl, uh, AI uh, Jeff Onan, etc., etc. We can just sit back and let the machines do our job for us while we have no source of income. So, this is The Conversation, and we have a lot of news and rumors to discuss on this episode. You know, we haven't done a strictly news episode for quite a while now, and really it's because every news story we've gotten has been either big enough to warrant its own episode, or small enough that it didn't even deserve to barely be mentioned on the show. So, uh, we've had a lot of... uh, Small news stories, well, it's not really small, but uh, significant, but still kind of small in stature in comparison to big news, like there's a new parrot in the Donkey Kong series. Uh, but they, they've been accumulating over the last month or so, and seeing as how we are now entering the E3 rumor-mongering season, I thought, you know, this would be a good time to just clear the air, address all of this on a, on a news topical conversation the, the type you won't ever listen to again Be, the, the kind that ages poorly that's what this episode is it ages so so poorly so before we get into the rumors of e3 and and what have you let's talk about dk vine's presence at e3 now cameron you were my wingman last year uh unfortunately you are not coming to me coming to e3 with me this uh june uh and i will miss you there we had some good times in that party house yeah unfortunately uh your wingman's ship is in the docking bay okay yes um, See, it's because it, because we're talking about Star Fox. it, it yeah I, I well you see you said ship and i'm thinking sea of thieves and uh and then i'm also thinking about how i i'm shipping squats and talks so my, my wires are crossed. Like, the, a Star Fox spaceship was, like, the third thing on the list there. Had no idea what you were referring to. But, no, I am uh, I'm going to E3 this year, and I will be rooming with Mitchell Wolf. Yes, uh, Southern California son Mitchell Wolf himself will be uh, my, my roomie in, in Los Angeles this time around. And we are not staying at last year's party house. Uh, we are staying in Koreatown, so that should be fun and uh, interesting. And Will, Will Mitchell and I, uh, can, can we coexist in the same space without driving each other crazy? That's what we're going to find out, uh, because I'm sure like he's neat and, and tidy and I'm the slob. It's going to be a wacky mismatch. And because we're going to E3, uh, that costs some serious money, and it's made possible thanks to you, the DK Vine patrons. Sincerely, from the bottom of my heart, thank you to our patrons who who stick with us month after month. It really does mean the world to me. And because of that, you can fund our inanity, our insane dedication to the Donkey Kong universe, to Rare, to Platonic, to... Retro Studios sometimes when uh, when they're not just making Metroid games. Oh, you know, look at me. I'm Retro Studios. I'm going to make a Metroid game. When everybody, the entire gaming media says, no, we want more Donkey Kong Retro. So, no. We, we love you, Retro. We love you no matter what you're making. And I realized, you know, when I, I was uh, but a prepubescent lad and then a post-pubescent teenager sitting at home following E3 coverage either in the pages of my magazine and then later on on the interwebs I thought Jesus Christ 
Nobody's covering the news I want them to cover. They've announced this new Donkey Kong game over here. Why aren't I seeing more screenshots of it? Why, why am I not getting the information I so desperately need as a Donkey Kong fan? And so one, one of the things I like to do when I'm out at E3, and sometimes it's easier said than done because, Cameron, you can attest to this, E3 is kind of uh, a nightmare when you're actually in attendance. Um, it, I, I think it's like the kind of thing people, at least in my experience, which was just the year they opened it up to the public, it's kind of like what people say about Disneyland or Disney World. Like, you're not going to be able to do everything you want Yeah. in one day. Luckily, there's very little I want to do at E3 except focus on the shit I like to focus on, which is uh, what what people are apparently backing us on on Patreon for. But no, I, I I am going to do my best to provide everybody the kind of coverage you would want to see. And you know, by the, by the end of the third day, it, it's kind of getting threadbare. There's really not much more you can say about the presence or lack thereof of Donkey Kong or the Donkey Kong universe at E3. But I'm going to do my best, and I'm going to be uh, opening it up, you know, m- multiple channels. We'll have YouTube videos, of course. Daily conversations are still in the docket. And, of course, we're going to have the DK Vine Inner Circle uh, for the uh, elite patrons, $25 a month and up. And I will be chiming in on the Inner Circle uh, all day and all night, just giving lots of crazy info uh, stuff that wouldn't really warrant a social media post, although there will be plenty of social media posts as well on uh, both Facebook and Twitter. So, uh, real quick, uh, plug into all of our upcoming E3 coverage. Back us on Patreon, dkvine.com slash Patreon. Follow us on social media, uh, Facebook and Twitter, and of course, subscribe to us on YouTube. And together we can make this the best E3 imaginable. And Cameron, even though you're not going to be in attendance, you're still going to be part of the the DK Vine family uh, in your home. And uh, I'm I'm sure the rest of the DK Vine staff will be uh, pitching in at the very least, uh, having fun with us uh, while we're actually in Los Angeles. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. That's another thing you learn actually being at E3. Um, you're on the pulse of a few very specific things, but you don't get the glut of information you do when you're just following it all at home. Um, well, that's kind of that's kind of the way it is for me just running DK Vine. I was setting up this episode, getting ready to uh, record it, and we, we had a start time of 7.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time. And then, of course, Rare drops this trailer for The Hungering Deep and Sea of Thieves, like almost right before we we record and i hadn't seen it so i had to suddenly amend like that portion of this show and i'm just like i can't keep up with the news just running dk vine alone so imagine that times 1000 at e3 and that's why i'm thankful you know i'll have you i'll have joe i'll have david uh you know matt has been a big help in years past just keeping me informed about what I'm not be able to see through the throngs of human flesh at, in the LA Convention Center. So, uh, we're, it, it's a team effort. It truly is. And uh, what, whether the DK Viners are going to be there in person or at home, we will be providing you the best uh, DK Vine related coverage. That includes Donkey Kong. Uh, well, rare is Donkey Kong. The Donkey Kong Country Donkey Kong. There's arcade stuff there. You know, who cares? <laughs> I'm doing a jerk-off motion right now. You can't see it because it's the podcast. And uh, Rare, uh, Platonic, and, um, of course, if, if Retro announces their new game, we'll also uh, touch upon that, whether it's Donkey Kong-related or not. So I guess that's a good enough segue as any to uh, get into the, the the big... I guess it's the big. It's It's certainly what I think the most people are interested in right now, uh, topic, and that is the rumor that I don't even want to say broke this week because that almost lends it too much credibility than it deserves. The rumor that materialized this week that Retro's n- new game, because obviously people are thinking about Retro again. I mean, every E3 we we get this topic: What's Retro working on? Because Retro re- represents 
this blank slate for Nintendo fans that they can project anything they want onto it. it it's like a it's a canvas that their artistic minds just imagine the, these grand masterpieces on. And what that means is because they've tackled Metroid, because they've tackled uh, Donkey Kong, and because Metroid Prime 4 has already been announced and Retro is not working on that, that means fans of every Nintendo franchise basically uh, imagine a wish fulfillment scenario where they get this Retro Studios developed game. Yeah, Retro's um, in this kind of unique position as a, a studio that's released hit after hit, has worked solely within um, established IP and is a is a is a western studio and you sort of get this projection of everything onto it people yeah when really yeah. it's you know maybe re- retro should maybe make the game they want to make <laughs> yeah i would kind of love to see a new ip from retro if i'm honest uh not that i wouldn't want to see another donkey kong game of course i would but um yeah it, it would kind of nice be nice to break this mold of Retro is just this this white knight, this messiah for any Nintendo fan base that is in dire need of a game at that time. I'm honest, honestly amazed that we haven't gotten uh, more like F, straight up F Zero rumors about Retro. Although the one we have, I guess, cuts it fairly close. So. Be- because in 2014, that's definitely what Retro wanted to do. Okay, they have this brand new platforming engine that they just spent all this work on. Let's chuck that all out and start up a racing game. Right. Um, well, the rumor is that they are working on a racing game. But it's not F-Zero. And it's not Diddy Kong Racing. Sorry, Kevin Callahan. It is Star Fox. The incredibly creative name Star Fox Grand Prix which okay um <laughs> so i think among the rumors is that that's not the final title or logo which but it has a, it has a logo Cameron like most of this rumor comes from a stupid logo which um like i i'm not on the pulse of this so i can't figure out why this rumor has the omnipresence it does um mm-hmm. Like, I don't know if the credibility is coming from, like, a bunch of different sources that are reputable to semi-reputable, have re- reputable having minor details on it, and they just sort of align with something that could be, could be a complete fabrication, I don't know. But just from my limited knowledge on the subject, I look at this logo that seems to be like the nexus point of everybody pointing to it um well you see on dk vine we kind of have a history of making fake logos like this all the time (laughs) and this looks like something that me or um the multi-talented matt corna could have whipped up for a joke video of ours in like the span of an afternoon how come Donkey Kong Golf never got this traction? I'm a little, I'm a little hurt. I've got to be honest. That oh, it's because we don't post on Reddit or 4chan. That that's pretty much why. Uh, no, no, I, I mean, I, I can't wait for uh, uh, Diddy Kong's crib hustling, ghost busting. Uh, Donkey Kong <laughs> versus Donkey Kong. Donkey Kong's on the Donkey Kong. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, what, what, but just, what was it? A Diddy, Diddy Kong racing Adam Hart mother. Yeah, just, which, just, which was a which was a play on Luigi <laughs> Luigi's Mansion, uh, Dark of the Moon. <laughs> just, just, just not to disparage the the graphic designer who created it. Just I, this this uses the same like Star Fox typeface that was used in the Star Fox Zero logo. It was like it, it's modified from the Star Fox Assault logo, which except that they got rid of the tail because it would be redundant with the one they had in the Zero. But um, just. The resources are out there for somebody to make something like this. It would not have to come from someone working at Nintendo or Retro in order to make this. Now I really want to see this, like, 
X-Files reboot, a complete reboot of the X-Files, where instead of looking for like paranormal activity and government conspiracies, they look they, they try to determine whether video game leaks are hoaxes or not. The resources are out there, Scully. <laughs> um, so maybe if they yeah. did get renewed, that would be in the next season. Yeah, yeah. Where <laughs> the it, it would be better than half of the episodes on the, in the new season. I'll say that much. Uh, I we obviously since since Chad departed, uh, DK Vine. We I I did not do an oops all tangents on the X Files season eleven. But suffice to say. I thought one episode was absolutely brilliant. One of the best episodes of television I've ever seen. A couple were adequate to decent, and the rest was uh, hot, stinking garbage. Uh, but uh, that that's a whole other topic. If you're an X-Files fan, you'll pretty much suss out what those episodes are just from that description. But, yeah, this, I'm not on the pulse of this either, Cameron, and this is what I'll say about this, and the reason I'm a little skeptical of Star Fox Grand Prix. It's such a... That's not even a good placeholder name. Like, literally, straight up Star Fox Racing would, would have more, like, pow than Star Fox Grand Prix. That, like, it's Star Fox Grand Prix sounds like such a fucking fake name. So, like, just just lazy enough, but it, it it's... Ooh, Grand Prix! So it sounds a little bit, like, uh, pompous. <laughs> and, and I don't know. It just... It just... It, it rubs me the wrong way somehow, and the re- I personally through it, it's kind uh, of inco- it feels incongruous with the with the like sci-fi nature of Star Fox. A little exactly, bit. exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I have not gotten any info leaked to me by my sources, uh, whether that be Dave Throat or whomever, about this, and. And that's not to say I necessarily would have if they didn't feel like leaking anything to me. And that's fine. Because, obviously, DK Vine, you know, we cover a wide breadth of, of material. No, we don't. That's a lie. But we, we, we cover more than Donkey Kong, but people hear the we name We cover DK a Vine. wider breadth than you'd think. Yes. <laughs> a, a wi- Yes, yes. A, a, but most of our breadth is of the wild. And that's... Uh, Donkey Kong and other assorted animals, but people hear DK Vine and think, "Oh, it's a Donkey Kong website." So everything that's ever been leaked to me generally is Donkey Kong related, and so it's not that like, "Oh, Retro is working on this and it's a Star Fox game." They wouldn't necessarily think DK Vine's kind of want, kind of want to know this because, of course, Tricky was in Diddy Kong Racing, and then the the backstory prequel for him was later turned into a Star Fox game and from that we get the unofficial Star Fox Adventures trilogy the Dinosaur Planet trilogy and nobody's going to know that not even a, a well placed source who knows of DK Vine so um i mean they might know that i don't know but the, it, i haven't heard anything about this and i feel like i'm I, I might have, and everything I've heard, it, it's just, this it seems like it's come from nowhere. And it's not that I don't think Retro could have been working on it. Sure, I'm absolutely capable of being wrong here, but my hunch, my gut feeling tells me this is fake. I don't know. Um, yeah. I, um... it, p- p- people want to be so cautious nowadays because they always want to be right about this stuff. This is something I brought up during the, the Smash Brothers rumors and whatnot, and pe- people don't like to come down firmly on one side or the other, because if it gets revealed to be real, then everybody who said fake, fake, fake will look silly. But if you tr- truly believe it, then you'll look silly when it's revealed to be fake. And, you know, I don't care. I, I really don't care. Be- I don't care what people think of me. I-, I have been exposed as a hypocrite more times on this show than I care to admit. So, actually, I don't mind. I- I'll admit it. I am a hypocrite. And uh, I as much as I would like to say I can read the tea leaves, I have been wrong on occasion. I didn't believe the some of those uh, Super Smash Brothers for Wii U slash 3DS leaks when they came out. And lo and behold... Uh, they were real, real. Like I didn't believe uh, Bowser Jr. and the Duck Hunt dog. I thought that was fake at first. Eh, I was wrong. So 
I'm going to say I don't believe this right now, but that's not to say it, it couldn't be a possibility. Or it, if it might be in development, but it might not be Retro who's working on it. Or it might be something Retro uh, has, has been doing top secret, and there, there's been no leaks, not even from my sources. So I don't even know. It could Cameron, even be some wires are crossed, and like there's some half-truths buried in this, but... The yeah, actual it's, it's lead is off. I don't really know. Um, I'm kind of skeptical about this, but also just saying hard line that this doesn't exist, let's move on, makes for boring podcasting and boring conversation. So let's just entertain the notion that this could be a thing. Um, well, I did, ju- I did just check Kevin Callahan's blog, and he has not updated, so... <laughs> Because I thought, you know, this would be a perfect chance for Kevin Callahan to ride the bandwagon here. Like, he, he could have said, yeah, this is what Diddy Kong Racing 2 was. Yep, they, they turned it into a Star Fox game. But I was right. If I was Kevin Callahan, that's what I would have done. Like, I would, I would say, put if I can put aside the fact that this might be a complete fabrication, um, like, designed to sound ridiculous, um... I would be totally into this game. Um. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let's let's describe to the people who who may not have heard the rumor what um what the rumor is. Okay. So the rumor states that Retro Studios of Texas, who's made some great Metroid games, but we'll, <laughs> I'm not going to do the whole Reggie thing. But whenever I hear Retro Studios uh, pronounced in that kind of like sing-songy, like, ending on a high. At Retro Studios, I always think of Re- uh, Reggie and his uh, E3 2010 introduction to tr- uh, Donkey Kong Country Returns. Um, but um, it says that Retro Studios is working on a Diddy Kong Racing, and Diddy Kong Racing is brought up numerous times, which is why I, I make the Callahan connection. A Diddy Kong Racing type game with the Star Fox cast, and it's been likened to F Zero, but he, here are more rumors that have been piled on top of this mess. And this is courtesy of Liam Robertson, who I believe was the lead singer of Oasis. I, I, I'm not sure who the hell he is, but uh, we'll just say uh, I didn't know who Sal Romano was either. But I hear he makes some great macaroni. So uh, Liam Robertson, this is his Wonder Wall of Star Fox rumors. So. The game is apparently, and, and and by the way, I'm giving stank eye to all of these. You can't see it, but remember how in Star Fox Adventures, Fox was constantly rolling his eyes? Yeah, that's what I'm doing right now. Okay. The game is a mixture between classic Star Fox and racing. So, fuck you, Star Fox Adventures. Get out of here. None of your shit in this. Uh, you shoot enemies to propel forward and get combos you can shoot other players too. What? Like I okay, we'll, we'll we'll wait to parse this out after I'm done. Each Grand Prix is three tracks with a boss fight where the boss comes onto the track. It has a big hub area where you can interact with the Star Fox characters. You pick up new missions at the hub and there's story content to go through. The game looks really, really good in motion. I don't know. A good-looking Retro Studios game. Yeah, you're right. He also heard Retro was considering adding cameos, like Donkey Kong. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> hey! So... <laughs> hey, okay, here, here's my position on this. all this camera. Like, like you said... I, I, I'm skeptical. I am more than skeptical. I am basically sticking a thumb up my asshole to keep from laughing too hard at this. But, but, because that's what you do when you, we have to stifle laughter is, is, is you uh, pleasure the prostate. No, what I think is I would love the hell out of this game if it was real. If it was real, I would have no problem with the Retro Studios doing this. This sounds like catnip. Uh, to DK Vine. This sounds... I mean, this this is basically the kind of game that we would have fantasized about during the buyout era when, uh, like, Star Fox was still this really, really main pillar of 
discussion on DK Vine where we, we desperately wanted more and more Star Fox to continue the story that Rare started with Adventures, the story of Fox and Crystal and Tricky and the the monetary issues of Team Star Fox and them burning through flagships and all of that great stuff. Um, so th- this sounds exactly like what me from 12 years ago would have just been doing cartwheels over. So yeah, absolutely, I would want to see this. And the way the pitch makes it sound is there's no way that this would necessarily just follow up from Star Fox Zero's story. Like, you'd have to have Crystal in there, right? You'd have to have elements from the three games that Nintendo doesn't like to reference. Yeah, it's, <laughs> even if you just put this in kind of its own continuity bubble, it seems like just a waste of potential to ignore all of the characters who weren't in 64 and Zero that you have to work with in this um, that you could use to flesh out the roster. Um, Crystal, um, Panther from Star Fox Assault. Uh, mm-hmm. You'd even, like, well, go. you could even dip into like definitely defunct continuity and bring in uh, Mew and Faye from Star Fox 2. Well, you know, my whole thing about Star Fox continuity is I think fans are way too literal when it comes to Star Fox continuity. There's a way to make it all work. So so many people, like, really, really f- are, like, fundamentalist about, no, Star Fox for the SNES was rebooted into Star Fox 64, and then Star Fox 64 was rebooted into Star Fox Zero. And there's a way, like, we're the people who have made Donkey Kong Land 2 work. So I look at that, and I'm just like, they can all coexist in the same timeline. You just have to, like, get creative or overtly silly with it and and the interesting thing about that is i think like nintendo even didn't they promote star fox zero like they didn't want to say this is a reboot they said something along the lines of this is a parallel adventure with star fox 64 or something like that like something very non-committal to kind of give them leeway with it well holy shit does that mean perry's gonna be an item in the game no, that that was that was weak. Uh, so, yeah, no, it, uh, not not to go on another DC Comics rant uh, that takes over an hour, but uh, it, it reminds me of the way DC Comics promoted the new Fifty Two, where they said it's not a reboot, no, 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 and then it was it was the biggest reboot they've ever done. <laughs> but, uh, but but it was a reboot that had like in universe like uh, justifications, like people were fucking with the timeline and whatnot. But yeah, I mean. The, the way I see it is, ultimately, you can say, like, oh, the the three Star Fox timelines can't coexist, but then you lose out on characters. You lose out on things that they're going to want to milk, especially in games like Smash Brothers or in a game like a Star Fox Racer. So, yeah, they could just have it be ambiguous. It could, it could exist in any version of the timeline, or you could use my argument and say they all exist in the same timeline anyway. And I think now that Star Fox 2 has been made official a- as a release, thanks to the um, the mini Super Nintendo, yeah, you could bring in those characters too. Like, just just have it be this this omni celebration of Star Fox, and that's great. And as I, it cannot on- possibly be harder for DK Vine to deal with than Banjo Pilot was. No, no, and we made Banjo Pilot work by just saying it existed when it existed, and Gruntilda used a hologram body. <laughs> <laughs> a hard light hologram body to she projected around her skull so she could fly an airplane. Um, but I, I twattered on Twitter and I said, hey, Retro Studios, I don't know if this rumor is true or not, but can you put Tricky in as a boss character? Because that would kind of be perfect. Uh, and <laughs> they haven't responded, but tw- uh, Retro Studios is notoriously slow when it comes to their social media presence. So I I expect if it is true within six months, we'll we'll, I'll get a like from retro studios on that one. (laughs) Um, So uh, I want, I want to talk a a little bit about continuity here, a little bit more about continuity, because I said it could, it should plausibly, I don't know. I I might've said this before we started the actual podcast proper, but you think you, you were commenting on my choice of YouTube and SoundCloud artwork for this episode because I use the Star Fox Command Fox, which you absolutely hate. Cameron, get on a soapbox. It, Tell me why you hate it. it. 
it's probably like the most unappealing version of Fox McCloud that's featured in the Star Fox game. It's everything was so smooth on those uh, character models; like they looked like they were slathered in Vaseline. To, to me, it's not even the rendering quality. Like I get what they were going for. They were, I think, they were going for like a an in between of the the very um, angular Star Fox sixty four renders and everything that's come after them but like the shape of fox's head looks really weird to me his forehead is so huge um with that, is, is that the why the enemies in star fox the... com- is that why the enemies in star fox command were called the anglers <laughs> sorry <laughs> sorry that was bad too i want to just shut up now sorry continue <laughs> I mean that's pretty much it, and unfortunately, like it's, it's probably my least favorite design for Fox, and it's the one that has kind of carried forward as like the basis for his Smash Brothers models. Which, to their credit, they do a lot a much more appealing job. Um, Zero finally kind of moved away from it a little bit, which I was glad to see. Yeah, yeah. I I mean, obviously, I like the the rare Star Fox adventures designs the best, but I also really like the assault ones. They weren't great, but I liked how upgraded and evolved all of their armor and gear looked, and it just made sense that after the windfall of uh, cash they would get after the Soria mission, that they would just be like. I, I just like, completely like they they look they look like like professional mercenaries in that game, I, and they didn't just look like <laughs> pilots, you know. I like how it also reinforces that I think I think Fox is just bad with money, like <laughs> yes. really, just like you you spent what was it like seven or eight years in poverty because you had one paycheck and then took out the your major source of income as a as a morally upstanding mercenary. Yeah. And the the second thing you do when you finally get another payday, just splurge. Splurge. Upgrade the Great Fox. Upgrade all your ships. Get new uniforms for everybody. Individual custom fitted uniforms. And then, and then you lose the Great Fox anyway. It blows up at the end of the game. <laughs> <laughs> so then they can't even afford a new one, so they have to just use this, like, hollowed-out aircraft carrier. <laughs> yeah, I really love that that unofficial trilogy of games, starting with uh, Adventures. I, I love how things just progress. It's, it's the most logical, linear progression in a Nintendo series outside of Donkey Kong. Actually, it surpasses Donkey Kong. It's just fantastic how there is cause and effect and correlation the whole time. And it it really made those characters feel real to me, which is why I I am completely game about revisiting them. Oh, yeah. And that gets to, like, a point of why I would not be upset if this game was what it was. Like, I know some people are, like, very non-receptive to Star Fox games that aren't, um, like, your traditional like, in the mold of Star Fox 64, which, yes, I absolutely think more games need to be in that mold. It's kind of ridiculous to me that, like, so many titles since then have gone the, like, very experimental route, like, with it and not just done a traditional sequel. But at the same time, a ton of the appeal in Star Fox to me is the cast and um, the just all of the sci-fi vehicles. And this is taking those and transplanting that into a new genre that, one, I also enjoy, and two, is very underserved right now, Racing Adventures. Um, So, yeah, yeah, yeah. this is... This would be a winning formula for me. (laughs) Well, I, I was talking about continuity, and it's actually something the supposed premise of the supposed game it, it, it's it's something that was actually set up in one of the endings to Star Fox Command uh, and that was the Curse of Pigma ending and that's where spoilers Fox and for Fal- <laughs> yeah sorry sorry we are spoiling uh, A, the... I think it's like over 10 years old at this point which, oh yeah it came Jesus out it came Christ. out what 2006 right yeah so oh, god um, 
I but by my, the way, this is... I think my back cracked just hearing this. <laughs> <laughs> but by the way, this is also exactly how Avengers Affinity War ended, so spoilers there, too. So... <laughs> It basically has, th- th- this ending, the Curse of Pigma ending, has Fox and Falco retire as mercenaries, and they become racers in the G-Zero circuit, Can, where they retro where they retrofit their R-wings into racing machines. This is also the same ending where Crystal left to stay with Star Wolf, Star Wolf saved the day, and Falco was able to persuade Fox to do this racing adventure as he was drowning his sorrows at a bar. <laughs> <laughs> Why do they never make a sequel to this game? <laughs> yeah, th- th- this is one of the lighter endings, too. Um, no, it's also funny. This is also what happened to Han Solo after the original Star Wars trilogy, except Le- Leia did not leave him to join Boba Fett or something. Uh, but... Uh, Han, instead of like taking a role in the New Republic government, he became a race car driver or a swoop driver or whatever the hell they call it in Star Wars. And uh, so I, I, I kind of like that Fox would do the same thing if he ever left the uh, freelance fighter pilot gig. Uh, but so, yeah, it's, it's something that uh, actually has roots in in the continuity in that and especially the dinosaur planet trilogy so yeah i'd be all for it um and of course you know there there are connections there with diddy kong racing star fox does have this invisible tether to diddy kong racing thanks to the tricky connection but then there's also been Things like Fox befriending Diddy Kong and Super Smash Brothers Brawl, and just th- this weird little uh, companionship between the two series. They're, they're, they've always kind of existed side by side, starting with uh, the development of Dinosaur Planet, and they, they've never fully broken this link between them. And and uh, granted, we we've played a small part in that as far as continually stoking people's association with it uh, in the fan community but um, I, I I would love to see this happen and if we can't get a new Diddy Kong Racing game this would almost be the the next best thing outside of you know Donkey Kong Racing or you know anything of that and sort. This would in a way kind of make sense like if you wanted to do a Diddy Kong Racing type game um most of the Diddy Kong Racing cast is, at the moment, legally off limits to Nintendo, barring some sort of negotiation. So, right. if you wanted to transpose the genre onto another cast of characters, this this is a way to do it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And granted, I'm sure Phil Spencer would play ball if Nintendo really wanted to use Pipsy. But knowing Nintendo the way I know them, they will never want to use Pipsy. So. <laughs> I think it's a moot point. Um, although it would be a shame if Wizpig wouldn't be in this game. And, and he's owned by Rare and Microsoft. So I don't really see any chance of Wizpig making an appearance. But you I, never know. I, you never know. I, I want to see what happens when he tries to occupy occupy a planet that's armed. Right. Because he, exactly. sat, he sat down on Timbers Island, which was basically a resort for people who like to race. A, a resort, a resort for woodland critters who like to drive go karts. Yeah, it's like no, he wasn't no, really aiming his, his sights high there. C- Corneria's dealt with Andros and the Aperoids. They'll see you coming, Pigma. I mean, uh, see, I'm getting. Well, th- there you go, there you go. Because uh, I, I mentioned see, you, this in the inner circle. Yeah, see, you made this joke, and this is why I made the association and said Pigma I, instead I, of yeah. Pig. Okay, so because Explain. the character of Pigma, the care of Pig, spoilers again, the character of Pigma died in Star Fox Assault. In Star Fox Command, there was this sort of, like, uh, an AI version of Pigma in, like, this cube form, and what will look like when our AI versions take over the show in five years. But that, that version of Pigma, it would be great if we could tie him into Wizpig or Wizpig's home planet. Or we find out Pigma came from Wizpig's home planet. There's a lot. There's a lot you could do there uh, because they're very similar in uh, 
their nature and their personalities. They both. Uh, I, I know, like they I think both it just extends call- to a. They're both pigs, and b. They're both awful, awful people. Yeah, they're heinous. <laughs> they call people little worms, and they yeah, they're they're they're, they're awful. Um, we have we have a. They're both, you call us a I think their their personalities are both analogous to schoolyard bullies. Like that's that's a summation of both of them. I don't know. You said uh, analogous, and I wanted to make an analingus joke there, uh, but then I imagined Pigma and Whizpig engaging in that shared act. And while it was quite romantic, and there were many lit candles and wine, and it, it, it was really a lovely scene. That's a scene I never want to revisit in my head again. So we have a few calls to take, Cameron. Uh, not about Whizpig and Pigma engaging in consensual ass licking, but uh, about the Star Fox. Grand Prix rumor. I can't even say it without laughing. The Star Fox Grand Prix rumor. So I want to. I want to take these calls and uh, we'll we'll hear what some of our listeners think about this thing that exists on the internet. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, hey, how you doing? Uh, Long time listener, first time caller. Uh, yeah, I'm calling to talk about this rumor that uh, Retro Studios is making a Star Fox racing game, and uh, I'm not gonna lie, I am a little concerned. Because uh, people are telling me that this is going to be another Mario plus Rabbids. You know, it's going to get revealed, and that we're going to look like fools for doubting them because it's going to be great. But here's the thing. A spin-off like that has no bearing on either the Rabbids or Mario. Because Rabbids are always going to be shovelware garbage. And Mario is always going to have some of the best games of all time. Meanwhile, Star Fox has not had a good game free of disgusting gimmicks and awful alternative gameplay styles since 1997. Alright? So you're going to have to excuse Star Fox fans for being a little concerned when we hear that we're not getting the evolution of Star Fox 64 that we We've been asking for for 21 years, but instead, we're getting Star Fox go-karting. I mean, where do we go from here? If this does well, do we get Star Fox golf? Is Fox going to go skiing at the Olympics with Sonic the Hedgehog? And is this really the IP that we needed a racing game? I mean, where is F-Zero? Where is Wave Race? Where is Diddy Kong Racing 2? Kevin Callahan, if you are listening right now, you are going to pay for your lies. If I see you on the street, I'm going to take a banana and shove it right up here. Oh, we're getting a little heated here. Got to cool down. Gotta find my cheat. Okay, so, uh, yeah, just wondering what you guys think of this rumor, and, uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Wow, I had no idea Chad's Bernie Sanders impression from 2016, or more likely his, his Donald Trump impression from mid-2016 that was really just a Bernie Sanders impression could gain a life of its own and call in. That's I, quite impressive. I greatly admired that ability to speak both clearly and quickly at the same time. Um, we could really get the uh, the time down on these episodes if we started talking like that. I know. We'll just do a shit ton of cocaine, apparently. Thank you for the call, uh, Bernie Sanders. Um, well, Bernie here wasn't happy about the rumor. Um, not, I, I imagine people would be calling in saying, No, oh, Retro's got to make a third and final entry in their Donkey Kong Country trilogy. And uh, I will address that a little bit, too, here after we take the calls. But uh, not happy because he says he wants an evolution of Star Fox 64, which I kind of have to raise an eyebrow over a little bit. Um, Sorry, Bernie. uh, But the way I see it is we have gotten that game. It's just we've gotten it a couple times since Star Fox 64. It just... People never seem to be satisfied with it, and I'm not sure why. Uh, mm, I don't know. I kind of disagree there. I mean, I, I will grant you assault um, as one. What's the What's the second one? Uh, well, why isn't Star Fox Zero uh, an evolution of Star Fox 64? Well, for one thing, it barely evolve. It, it barely it, it barely counts as an evolution when it's kind of the same thing all over again um <laughs> well uh, okay okay and uh, the gamepad a lot okay i, I don't want to relitigate my thoughts on star fox zero for the benefit of the audience sure sure uh um, it, but i mean it I was wasn't th- what i would have liked it to be it has redeeming qualities but it's not i don't I know why I, that, that's fair enough i don't know why assault gets the bad rap it gets though 
I, I think Star Fox Assault is exactly what people imagined a sequel to Star Fox 64 being in 1997. And I don't really know why it's just derided online. Like, I, I wasn't expecting anything when I booted up Star Fox Assault. And I, I first played it, like, this decade. I, I, I didn't really dip my toes into it when it came out. I, I played it um, probably around 2010 or 11 or uh, somewhere along those lines. And I absolutely loved it. I, it blew me away how much I loved it. it. I love it way more than Star Fox 64. And I think it just... It takes the mechanics of Star Fox 64 and it just expands what Star Fox 64 can be. And, and what Star Fox can be. What the gameplay can be. What you can do. I, I love that the there were R-Wing missions, sure, but the, the, the Landmaster, the on-foot missions, they were, they were fun, too. Um... And I, I think it's sometimes a point of contention how many of the levels are the open world on foot ones. But I, the question just occurred to me, Heil, do you think that those would have been better received um, coming straight off of Star Fox 64? Like if you didn't already have adventures coming in between and the whole um, backlash over that being exactly what it said it would be. Absolutely. No, absolutely. Uh, I really think after Star Fox Adventures, people were in no mood for even the slightest deviation from Star Fox 64. I think had you released Star Fox Zero then, it, it would have been way better received than it was when it was released um, when it was on the Wii U. I, I think, I don't know, people are weird and fickle as we've seen from the release of Tropical Freeze, how you can release a game like Tropical Freeze in 2014 and have people absolutely just going ape shit over it in a bad way and then you release it in 2018 and people are going ape shit over it in a great way so and, and I granted we we say people you're never going to please everybody all the time but. no absolutely i i just mean the general consensus there's always a general consensus whether it be right or wrong and especially on the internet, there is a consensus. And the internet now influences our daily lives in the real world, too. So there's really no dis distinction to be made between internet people and real life people. It, it, it's all intermingled, yeah. whether we like it or not. I mean, a, but a, a good example of that dichotomy, a bunch of people complained about Tropical Freeze, but um, Switch sales are doing pretty darn good. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it, it's, it, it reminds me of, like, the, the way, the opinion of, like, Sea of Thieves when it was released last March. Like, the, the consensus was, oh, this is, there's nothing to this game. But, lo and behold, there is a, now a, just a dedicated core group of fans that have shown no sign of, of withering away. And, you know, had Sea of Thieves come out at a different time, had the hype been slightly different... It, it could have had a, a ecstatic critical reaction. Not to say the critical reaction to Sea of Thieves was bad. It was decidedly mixed. But, you know, it, it's funny how a narrative just takes takes us away. And how that narrative quickly forms. And how just a different set of circumstances can completely alter that narrative without anything else really fundamentally changing about that point of contention, about that topic at hand. We saw it with Tropical Freeze. I very much doubt New Funky Mode is just the, the thing that really makes people decide Tropical Freeze is a masterpiece all of a sudden. The it's people not. do it's love just... the hell out of Funky. Um, I, yes, can yes, I, yes. Can I actually, you know, I, I'd like to share this anecdote because I don't think I've shared it on the show. Um, sure. We talked about Avengers Infinity War earlier. Don't worry, no spoilers. Um, before the movie aired in my theater, um, there was a... Like, one after the other, there were trailers for um, Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze and Sea of Thieves. And one of the highlights of that movie-going experience, like, sometimes audience members in a theater leave you, like, with a worse experience for seeing the movie. Sometimes they enhance it. Um, during the previews, um, the Tropical Freeze commercial came on. Funky came on screen. And some guy in the row in front of me just shouted, like, in... Like pure bliss, Funky Kong. <laughs> I, 
<laughs> it sounds like he, he was engaging in some of the same <laughs> recreational activities at Funky Kong. So, uh, is I haven't to. seen that guy since like 1990. And then I think he trailed off because he couldn't remember the year. But it depends yeah. if he played Donkey Kong 64 or not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, do, yeah. Do you remember Funky Kong being an arms dealer and selling guns to children? <laughs> DK Vine remembers. I mean, it worked for Oliver North. Oh, Reagan era political humor only on the conversation. So yeah, that that, that and I love that, and and it's just so funny to me that people are just rapturous about Tropical Freeze just four years later at a slightly different point in our time and and 2014 people had pitchforks and torches out for exactly the same game it's so anyway we're, we're kind of getting besides the point here we're getting pretty far away from the topic at hand it was just that I think Star Fox Assault is a highly underrated and it is the game star fox fans have been waiting for it's just they never gave it the chance I, I also, i'm not saying all star fox games all, all star fox fans but i think people really need to pick it up again i'd also just say as an aside um just just like star fox adventures when it came out making a star fox spinoff would not preclude a main series title from getting made no and I, I always think, and this was an argument about what went wrong with the Donkey Kong series during the buyout era, was that you kind of do need a core game in the series, fresh in people's mind, in order to support a more flight of fancy spinoff. You know, I, the pay-on games, the, the, pe- the pegging titles, King of Swing and Jungle mm. Climber probably would have done a whole of a hell lot better had there been a Donkey Kong Country game around the same time to stoke people's interest in Donkey Kong. Now would be a great time to release a pegging game. Pay on if you're still out there somewhere. Give us a new pegging game. But um, we had we had Jungle Beat as the main console title at the time. And Jungle Beat was tied to the bongos. And Jungle Beat was aesthetically so different from everything else with Donkey and, Kong. And featured a grand total of one parentheses or two characters who were featured in all of the rest of the games. So there's not really a lot the, of room for cross-promotion. And thank you for not forgetting the banana. I, I was going to get on your case, Cameron, if you forgot the banana. Um, but it's, it sounds like Bernie Sanders wants to shove a banana up someone's ass. So maybe we should just let the banana rest for now. So anyway, <laughs> Bernie 2020, he'll shove a banana up your ass. So anyway, yeah, to, to, to the caller, um, I... I would also love Star Fox Golf. I've got to be honest. I love a good golf game, too. So I, I'm a sucker for mascot racers and mascot golfing games. So I would be perfectly fine if Star Fox got both. <laughs> so I, I'm the wrong person to complain to here. Uh, but, yeah, I don't know. Um, pick up Star Fox Assault. Seriously. It can't be that hard to find a copy. Play it on the GameCube or whatever. You're gonna have a good time if you go into it with an, an open mind. That, that's that's my opinion, anyway. Uh, in the meantime, we'll we'll just see if this rumor is true or not. Like I said, I, I doubt it is, but uh, if, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, and I'll be happy if I'm wrong because I kind of want to play the game anyway. All right, uh, let's let's take the next call, Cameron. Hey, Heil and Heil's Slam Peace. This is six-time caller here, proud winner of a Mr. Mooney Award and a Mr. Vagina Award, which is what Donkey Kong gives you anytime you lose a game of Super Mario Sluggers. Mario Super Sluggers. Super Mario Super Sluggers. That retro rumor of a Star Fox racing game, it seems like it could be an appropriate move. We already had a perfect Dinosaur Planet trilogy with Adventures Command and Assault, and it would make sense for the fourth entry to be a racing game in the same vein as the Crash Bandicoot trilogy, uh, which was followed by a racing game, you know, Crash Team Racing, as well as Naughty Dog's next trilogy, the Jack and Daxter trilogy, which was followed by Jack X, the racing game. And I know Star Fox Zero was made 
after the Dinosaur Planet trilogy, which would make it four games. But, you know, it didn't have Crystal, of course. So hopefully this racing game will include Crystal, as they always need a bunch of characters for a racing game. But now what I'd really love to see would be a Star Fox baseball game, because it would have to utilize every character in the Star Fox roster. Damn it, me. Now I really want that. In all, in all, the Star Fox franchise has been superbly stagnant and dull, and I believe there's been three re- remix remakes of the original Star Fox, as they feel the need to reintroduce it the same way for every generation of children. Now, I really want Star Fox Baseball, thanks to you, Heil, or to me. As my disembodied voice exits this podcast, I want to leave you with one final query. There's a strain of weed out here in Los Angeles named Donkey Kong Heil. E3 is fast approaching in the, in the land of dank Donkey Kong weed. Sorry, I'm never using the word dank again. Just saying. You could wash down a hit of Donkey Kong weed with an angry orchard and go off in the jungle boots through Kingdom. Thank you, six-time caller. Um, okay, um, trying to dissect that call, as I always have to do with his calls. Uh, for starters, uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to indulge in any dank strain of Donkey Kong in Los Angeles during E3. E3, it's it's highly stressful, and it's something you have to be amped up for constantly, running on adrenaline and caffeine, and maybe a slight bit of alcohol when available. So I, I'm afraid the, the danker, the strain of weed the more it would dull my senses and make me unable to perform my dk vine duties so unfortunately i will have to take a puff on the kong at some later point in time uh, but as far as the rest of your call goes i i sense a lot of sarcasm dripping from your voice when you're talking about the perfect dinosaur planet trilogy <laughs> but uh star fox baseball yeah absolutely i, I I'd be game for that on one condition. Mm. That What's they that? get that they have a sponsor tie in with the Boston Red Sox and they call the game Fox and Sox. Okay. <laughs> or we just the, the the Boston uh Red Fox or the Boston Star Fox or just the Star Fox. Uh so anyway, uh the Cornarian Star Fox. Yeah, okay. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I, I, you pretty much hit a lot of the points we hit on earlier with the character discussion. You know, they would pretty much have to utilize the cast of characters when it, when it came to a Star Fox racing game. I very much doubt it would just be Fox, Falco, Slippy, and Peppy as playable characters. Or, and then maybe Star Wolf to balance it. I mean, it could be. It could just be, be eight characters. Would it be really tasteless to have James McCloud as an unlockable in a racing game? In, in the, what the F Zero configuration of James McCloud, the human James McCloud, or no, no, the the, f- the dead dad configuration of James McCloud. <laughs> so long as he was a ghost dad, because then we could take that term back from Bill Cosby, the monster. We 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 could we could have ghost dad jokes again, but it would be about Fox's dad. So every time we would say oh, "I'm a ghost dad," we would actually be quoting Fox McCloud. I think that's a great idea, Cameron. Yeah, that was Cameron's idea. Can't can't rest until all the pathos is just murdered out of Star Fox 64's ending. Like it was a, it was a big deal when he showed up as a ghost, and now it's just oh oh uh, it hey you you you're hanging around, guy. I liked Still how in there. Star Fox. I liked how in Star Fox Adventures he talked to you from a wishing well. <laughs> uh, thank you for the call, six-time caller. We have, uh, we have another call to take about Star Fox what, Super Circuit. What the fuck is it called? Star Fox Grand Prix. Okay. <laughs> what, what else can we possibly say about this game that doesn't even exist? Let's find out. Hey, DK Vine, it's 
Gnostic of 73 from Nintendo Nostalgia. I was calling in to your tweet, um, and I had a couple questions, obviously, for E3 stuff. Um, first one is, what is, do you think Platonic is going to be dropping some DLC news for ukulele? Like, I know we've had that big update on the horizon, or are they going to release the details to their next IP, the next game that they want to do? I mean, I, for one, I'd be excited both ways. Uh, I definitely want more Yuka stuff, um, but I don't know. We'll see. What are your thoughts on that? Um, but my big, big question here is, obviously, with the Star Fox rumors, I just finished listening to the game explain 30-minute discussion about it, and I have to say, it gets me really excited for the potential of it. Um, and not to mention, you know, the fact that Tricky is from Star Fox and Tricky is in Diddy Kong Racing. It makes sense. Um, but what I'm concerned about is, as much as I know I would enjoy Star Fox, my heart is truly with Diddy Kong Racing, and I fear, does this mean, if this is real, does this mean that Diddy Kong Racing doesn't have a place anymore? Will Nintendo not do anything with it? Because if anyone was to do it, I really think Monster Games or Retro would have done the Diddy Kong Racing, and it seems like they're taking a lot of elements from it and mixing it in with the, the Star Fox franchise, because obviously, you know, Rare still owns a lot of stuff from Diddy Kong Racing. They kind of share it, Nintendo and them, so they can't do anything with it. Does this mean Diddy Kong Racing can no longer get a future? Um, I don't know. Or is this just all a cover-up, and it really is a Diddy Kong Racing game? I guess we'll find out, but um, if this is even real at all, but... The Star Fox games does sound very enticing. I'm excited about it, but I also fear Diddy Kong Racing wouldn't happen, um, a sequel to it. So what are your thoughts? I mean, is this is do I have anything to worry about, or do you think there's a possibility they both could live in the same world now existing at the same time? Um, yeah, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Uh, thanks so much. Can't wait to hear the episode. It's been a couple weeks, but uh, I'm excited. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, guys. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Oh, thank you for the call. And, uh, yeah. By the way, you can check out my appearance on the Nintendo Nostalgia podcast. Did a Diddy Donkey Kong Country 2 episode, Diddy's Conquest. And uh, I, I appeared on that episode. And uh, we, I proudly broke the format of their show because my blabbering made them go an extra hour than they normally go. So it's nice to see that I can taint any podcast I appear on. Uh, <laughs> Cameron, uh, we'll, we'll get into the ukulele bit uh, of your call uh, in the next segment here on the conversation. But let's wrap up the Star Fox discussion with his concern and the concern of a lot of Donkey Kong fans. Now, his concern was primarily centered on Diddy Kong Racing, uh, but there's been a lot of people concerned that if Retro is working on anything that's not Donkey Kong, that means Donkey Kong is DOA again. And you, you can't spell Donkey Kong with DOA because there's no place to put the A. So what, what do you do? Uh, first of all, Diddy Kong Racing. I, as, as big of a proponent as I was, as much as I wanted to believe in Kevin Callahan, I honestly don't know if there would be any future for Diddy Kong Racing precisely for the reason you mentioned. Most of the assets to DKR are owned by Rare. I mean, this is, this is something a lot of people just completely lose sight of, and even I'm somebody who kind of forgets how much Rare actually owns of Diddy Kong Racing. And we, we've, you know, we've talked in the past, oh, who knows, even the lawyers don't know, but I think at the end of the day, when you really parse it out, Rare does own almost all of the characters and the tracks and the music for the game. They, they own everything that is Diddy Kong Racing, except Diddy Kong, except Crunch, and except Tricky some of the time. Tricky is kind of a gray area, but Nintendo has felt bold enough to use Tricky post-buyout. Uh, they used him in Star Fox Assault. Another reason you should play the game, people. Tricky's in it. So, because of that, you know, there there really isn't much to the Diddy Kong Racing IP except a name. It, it is really and Diddy weird Kong. when you think about it that the onus is presumed to be on Nintendo to revive the property, even though when you really think about it, 
it's a light it's a licensed racing game by rare and the licensed licensed property just happened to be diddy kong yeah 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 pretty much and I, it's it's kind of like that Muppets Christmas special that had like the Fraggle Rock characters and the Sesame Street characters and the regular Muppets. It's kind of like that after Disney has bought the 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 Kermit wing of the Muppets. It, it just what do you what do you do with this? It because it's now owned by three separate entities. That's what Diddy Kong Racing is, and I I think we're perpetually haunted by the lack of a Diddy Kong Racing follow up, a true Diddy Kong Racing follow up. It, you know, if if you discount Diddy Kong Racing DS, which you probably should, but I mean, it exists. We acknowledge it exists. I make the argument it's a new entry in the canon. Cameron, I know you may disagree with me, but and I I know also that I'm the one who just said new Funky Mode means Tropical Freeze for the Switch is a new <laughs> adventure. I- so I'm kind of of two minds about it. On the one hand, I don't want to think of it as a follow as a follow up because that's kind of lame. But um, at the same <laughs> at the same time, it is kind of hard to reconcile the fact that that game debuted the redesigned Tiny Kong. Yeah, yeah, Tiny and Kong is the is the wrench in and, the works. And normally, there. I'd just say like you know, it's like Diddy's eyes. You just kind of squint at it, pretend it was always that way, and move on. But uh, I don't know. We never got a DK sixty four remake that used that design, so um, it's just kind of this weird one off now. Um, yeah, you, well, and no matter how much you squint, you can't unsee that. It, it stays seared into your mind's eye. <laughs> I like the Tiny Kong read. Everybody hates the Tiny Kong redesign because oh, it's creepy or whatever. I like it just because it's continuity, it's characters aging. I like it. People, just 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 accept it. It, it happened. It's fun. It it's it just it's just a fun bit of lore now added to the Donkey Kong legacy. Just celebrate it. It's weird. Enjoy it. Embrace. Uh. Anyway, yeah, so the, the, we're perpetually haunted by the lack of Diddy Kong Racing follow-up, but it was made worse because we were going to get Diddy Kong Racing follow-ups. We were going to get Diddy Kong Pilot before it became Banjo Pilot, but more importantly, we were going to get Donkey Kong Racing. And Donkey Kong Racing was a follow-up to Diddy Kong Racing because Taj was a playable character in it. Taj! So be- because of that, we're just always remembering what almost was and what could have been. And I I think had Diddy Kong Racing never... Have we never been promised a follow-up to Diddy Kong Racing? Or two follow-ups to Diddy Kong Racing as it actually happened? And had Rare been sold to Microsoft and, and things just progressed without that tantalizing tease, then we would all be more accepting Diddy Kong Racing being a true one-off. Also, the fact that Wizpig returned in a spaceship and laughed at the end and it ended on a literal to be continued. That kind of <laughs> set our expectations up all the way back in 97. But And plus, you know, um, it was a highly successful game. It, it was. People forget it was the biggest game of 97, or at least the biggest Nintendo game of 97. It definitely broke the Guinness World Record at the time for most reservations for a video game. Anyway, uh, so... I, I've kind of hit this point where I'm never going to give up hope for new Diddy Kong Racing, but I'm also going to be realistic and ju- I'm, I'm going to assume that we're not going to get a new Diddy Kong Racing, at least not in the current yeah. configuration that exists I- between Nintendo and Rare and the way Nintendo does business. So... We're going to get spiritual successors, maybe from Platonic, maybe from Rare, maybe from within Nintendo. Maybe this Star Fox game would count. I I guess what I would say is if you don't see a Diddy Kong Racing follow-up after this theoretical game, (laughs) um, it won't have been, like, because a another game with another IP came out with an event with a racing adventure mode. That will have been a symptom of them not being able to use Diddy Kong, but it won't have been the cause. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And you can still take you could still take this in a wildly different direction. And the thing is you can have different types of racing games. You can have I mean Diddy Kong Racing coexisted with Mario Kart sixty four. That was kind of the point. 
Um, but also, also Rare kind of was just a rogue studio, <laughs> and they were just like, "Oh yeah, Nintendo, you made this game. Fuck you. He, we can do it better." And they did it in the same year, and it was fine because Rare made them a shit ton of money. I don't think that ethos of the way Nintendo is structured and organized nowadays would ever allow that situation to happen again. But also it, it consider mean we it now have I mean, like consecutively um, Hyrule Warriors and Fire Emblem Warriors. That that's true, but I, I don't know. There, there there would have to be just a very precise set of circumstances that would allow it, and I don't think those circumstances would would mean that retro studios would be developing the game. Or, or let's say, like, Monster would be developing Diddy Kong Racing while Retro would be developing Star Fox. I don't think that scenario would happen. I think a a very uh, well-regarded studio with clout would have to approach Nintendo and say, we want to make Diddy Kong Racing. And then they would be like, okay, here's a shit ton of money. Here's buckets of money. <laughs> make it for us. Then you would see it. But until then... It's not. I don't think it's going to come internally from Nintendo. It's not going to be Miyamoto is not going to say, "Hey guys, you know what? I really want to see revived Diddy Kong Racing." And I could be wrong. I have misjudged the man before, and I have misjudged people within Nintendo before, and they have surprised me. I never thought Miyamoto would go to bat for Donkey Kong Country, and he sure as hell did that at the at the uh, end of the odds. So, who knows? Uh, as far as the worry that Donkey Kong Country is is now dead in the water, do not worry about that, people. Whether or not Retro is working on a Donkey Kong game, it does not mean this is the end of the road for Donkey Kong. Uh, I, I have been told that we are going to be getting more Donkey Kong, and Donkey Kong stuff is in the works. I don't know what that means. I don't know from where that means, but... All I know is I would not worry. Also, just to reiterate on an earlier comment of mine, like consider that we're getting rumors about a Star Fox game being taken seriously after Star Fox Zero was notably a pretty significant uh, sales uh, failure. Um, yeah. Everything but, with the Wii U was a and, sales failure, though. I mean. And conversely... As I stated before, Tropical Freeze on Switch is doing very, very well at the moment. Yes. The the yeah. brand has some clout right now. Well, and Nintendo is invested in the brand, too. They And we're going to see that, especially with the theme park. And Donkey Kong is now here to stay as a viable Nintendo IP. There are going to be lean years. There, there are going to be... E3s that come in where we have nothing. And that's just going to be par for the course. It's not going to be like it was back in the the spin-off era where, you know, Rare would be announcing three Donkey Kong games at the same E3. That's that those days are gone and we just have to accept that, but we're not going to go you know, half a decade without anything to talk about. The, w- things are really good right now and just have faith that Nintendo is going to do right with the franchise. We can we can quibble about Kremlins and and you know, Animal Buddies and stuff like that. Sure, I, I don't know, but at the very least, Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Country is not going to be abandoned. That is what the Donkey Kong franchise is now. You know, they're they're making this theme park. That it's it's going to be Donkey Kong Island. It's going to be. Mine carts. It's not going to be girders. Donkey Kong Country is Donkey Kong, and there is going to be more Donkey Kong on the yeah. way. So whether or not it's from Retro or not, it doesn't matter. It matters if you if you really love Retro and you want to see them do another take on it, sure. But if you just want to see more Donkey Kong, then you're going to be in luck. All right, so... Uh, that, en- enough about a game that probably doesn't exist. Let's <laughs> let's get into. He brought up ukulele, so we have another call to take about ukulele content, and then we'll uh, just address it. We don't really have a lot to talk about here because the rumor mill is is not as robust uh, with with upcoming yuka content or DLC or whatever. But uh, I want to hear what this caller has to say. So uh, 
let's let's hear what they have to say, and then we will address the the topic at hand for ukulele. Hey guys, it's uh, Banjo Kaboom, aka Banjo Arivia, aka Andrew. Just call me Andrew, whatever. Um, so E3 rumors. Um, obviously, everyone's seen the tweet from Andy Robinson saying that he knows some of the games that are going to be announced at E3. So my question to you is, how likely do you think it is that they're going to even announce a ukulele? Given that in ukulele, one of the moves that you learn towards the end of the game is the, I think it's called the flip-flap flight or whatever the heck it is, where you can pretty much fly anywhere you want at any time. Because if they follow the same methodology as the other Banjo games, then you'll have all the moves from the first game to start off in the second game, and that would really make designing the levels pretty challenging. Uh, so, yeah, if, if they made a ukulele right off the bat and followed their old, old methodology, then they're going to be giving you the ability to fly anywhere right off the bat. So that doesn't seem like that really makes much sense. Um, but, yeah, what do you guys think? All right. Andrew Kaboom out. Thank you, uh, Banjo Kaboom, Kaboom Shaboom. Uh, well, I don't think we're going to see Tukalele at E3, and I don't think Tukalele is going to be Platonic's next game. I, I am still in the camp that thinks Shell from off of Galleon Galaxy is going to be the basis of their next game, and it's going to be a Jet Force Gemini spiritual successor. I, I, now that you mention I'm, I'm it, um, something, the, the thought just occurred to me, um... Like, people throw out the name Tukalele a lot, but, like, uh, Banjo-Tooie was something, like, very heavily, like, I, I can't even say hinted at. It was blatantly you were told you were going to get it at the end of Banjo-Kazooie. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't know if Ukulele really had the feeling of lead-up like that. Like, it left breadcrumbs they could continue on from, but it didn't seem like... Like a as much of a watch this space as uh, Banjo Kazooie's ending did. No, what Rare did with Banjo Kazooie and Banjo Tooie was audacious, and it, it blew up in her face a little bit because they couldn't make good on Stop and Swap. But yeah, they basically said this sequel is definitely coming. <laughs> <laughs> at the end of their game, they didn't even know if it was th that. That's how like fucking cocksure Rare was back then because they were like everything we do turns to gold. Fuck it, we're getting a sequel. I, yeah, let's promise it. I, I mean, I love that audacity. I would love to know <laughs> if the name Banjo Tooie had cleared marketing before they put that in, or they were <laughs> no. just brazenly banking on it. Like, no, no wonder Nintendo. T too late, guys. Cartridges went gold. It's out there. <laughs> no wonder Nintendo soured on them because they <laughs> forced shit like Banjo Tooie. <laughs> they couldn't do anything about it. And people forget Banjo-Kazooie was a Nintendo IP, so Rare was basically just like, hey, your big game in the fall of 2000 is going to be called Banjo-Tooie. I guess... <laughs> I could I just... Oh, my God. And the... And the <laughs> I'm just picturing... I'm just picturing, like... Greg Males, like, I don't know why I'm picturing Greg Males, because it's totally, uh, like, not his personality type, but I'm just picturing him, like, giving the double finger, to, to, like, to, like, on a conference call or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> the more you think about it, the more ridiculous that is, that they got that name through, and that was a game they actually released. All right. Uh, but you're right. There, there is no breadcrumbs for two. The, the only breadcrumbs there are are the pirate treasure, the 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 floating skulls or the twirling skulls that actually resemble the the skulls of the gold hoarder skull, skellies in Sea of Thieves. So you also have a little bit I, with like the mention of vile and a little bit of that, but that could just as easily be for another project they're working on. It's vague enough they could do anything with that. Right. Exactly. And. Pretty much what we know is coming, and this is based off of Platonic themselves sending out a Kickstarter uh, backer update about uh, Yuka. Uh, Platonic has been, kind of been 
not really radio silent. They've been retweeting like fan art and and meme stuff on on their Twitter, and you know they'll, they'll, they'll resurface every now and then. But they've been mostly quiet for the better part of the last year. I'm not the last year, but since 2018 began, they they really haven't done much, and. We know they've been working on something, and we also know that more ukulele stuff is coming because there's the uh, the 64-bit mode in Yuka that hasn't been up uh, added to it. So w- once Yuka came out for the Switch, they kind of shut down as far as being public and, about what what's going on in Platonic, and and so we we know that they're not done with Yuka, and we know that the uh, the, the little uh, inept robot uh, in Galling Galaxy is counting down to something. So I, I think we're going to be getting an additional world in ukulele. I, that's that's my hunch. Uh, another grand tome or so, something? I don't know. Yeah, you basically I, maybe... have the same assumptions I do, I, which is, I mean, I assume that the DLC entails... One additional world, and yeah, the 64-bit mode, which we already know is coming. Yeah, and I don't know if this is where the pirate treasure comes through. Like, you collect all the pirate treasure, you, you unlock this. Or if it's going to be a free update, like like the Sea of Thieves stuff. Or is, if it's going to be something you have to pay for, I don't really know. I think we're going to be finding out either during E3 or if... Since, you know, they're, they're an indie studio, we might be getting the news a couple days before E3. I could see them doing an announcement maybe the Wednesday or Thursday before E3 kicks off. I don't know. And they might be out at E3, too. Who knows? Um, I'll, I'll try to track down Andy Robinson and take a drink whenever I say his name. Uh, but what, I mean... Do you have any assumptions about this, Cameron, as far as, like, do you think that this is when they're going to announce the next uh, update for Yuka? Um, I really don't. Um, I kind of wonder if E3 would be the best venue for Platonic to do something like that. Um, just because they seem to... There just hasn't been any lead-up to it, aside from the, the notice that was sent out that you're going to see something from us soon, but... There hasn't really been the, like, social media lead-up or anything like that. Um, And I could be totally off-base, really, because that's kind of the whole nature of surprise announcements. Um, Yeah. I just... I mean, I'll I'll say I'm certainly not expecting a direct sequel at E3. Um, While they have the original game to wrap up first... Um, Well, yeah. Uh, So here's, here's my assumption. I... I think we're going to be getting more Yuka stuff announced around E3, either adjacent to E3, before E3, or during the show itself. The only reason I think that is because that is when the most people are paying attention to video game news, and I could see Platonic wanting to be a part of it. Because, you know, you don't, you don't want to be left out, and DK Vine, you know, we, we never want to be left out at E3, even though everybody... It, it's the worst time to drop content that is unrelated to gaming news and in the past we've always made the mistake of let's do this this 30 minute animated feature starring ted the boat builder and drop it during e3 or let's do the hall of fame and and we ended up just killing ourselves because one this is the worst time to try to do original content not related to news and two nobody cares so uh i i but i could see platonic wanting to get in on the news cycle. Um, so who knows? Uh, I, I do... Well, while I think we're going to be getting Yuka stuff, I am unsure if Platonic will then use the opportunity to also announce their new game. And when you think about it, having Yuka content and announcing their next project would be a good one to punch and really get Platonic back in the, the headlines. And so I don't think it's going to be too Kalele. I, th- I think... Announcing a direct sequel to Ukulele already would basically be a bad move. I think Platonic's got to show they, they're capable of other types of games, other types of genres, and I think that's what. And all their other comments in the past have suggested that their next game, they already knew what their next game was going to be during the development of Ukulele, 
and it's not going to be a sequel to Ukulele. But the character who is going to be the, the star or the focus of their next game was in Ukulele. So that's why I'm saying Shell, but it, who knows? It, it might be that Vendy game we're all desperately. It- it could be Dream somebody enough. who isn't Shell, but she, of any character introduced in Ukulele, is the one I'd be most intrigued to see in another game. Well, it's also because Shell felt the most uh, off as far as... She felt like the most backdoor piloty character in the game. She, it was like a Matt LeBlanc appearing on Married with Children, and you're like, what the fuck is Matt LeBlanc doing here? That's what Shell was. Just clearly there to set up a new project... And and that's her whole point of existence in the game itself. So, like, apparently uh, she's a space witch, which seems like a very oddly specific thing to yes to describe yeah. a a character who's only going to appear once. The rest of the ukulele characters were sign with googly eyes or vending machine with googly eyes and and here's this very detailed character with a very elaborate backstory that we only get like a brief introduction to it's gotta be her it's gotta be her so uh but i am excited for platonic be back in the news because quite honestly i'm a fan of ukulele uh i i i know i know it's not a popular opinion as, as Chad's Bernie Sanders impression, or Donald Trump impression, whatever that was, went back during the election that everybody loves talking about. But I love ukulele. F- flaws and all, I think it's just a, a great romp. It's, it's nostalgia, but it also, I, I think it plays great. I think people overlook how smoothly and how sweet the play control is in that game. It's hard to go back to Banjo after playing Ukulele. It, it, it's weird to say, but I've tried to play Banjo on Rare Replay, and I find myself faltering because it's not as crisp as Ukulele. They did a great job with, with the play control, the mechanics of Ukulele. Uh, whatever faults the game has isn't enough to detract from the just bliss I get playing it. So I'm excited to see what Playtonic has coming out next. And I'm also excited to play Ukulele on the Switch, which I'm going to be downloading here in the next day or two. Uh, I, I did a Twitter poll. Hey, what should be the next Switch game I bought? I buy? And everybody said Mario plus Rabbids. But here's the thing, people. The Donkey Kong DLC is not out yet, and I don't want to give Nintendo the impression I'm buying the game based on its own merits. I want them to know I'm buying it because it's going to become DKU. So you know what? I think I'm going to go with ukulele as my next purchase. But thank you for your input, Twitter. Thank you. <laughs> oh, and the, the, the flight move. We had the question, uh, how would that work in ukulele if you could fly everywhere? I don't know. It barely works in ukulele. I love, I love that it gives you the freedom, but it absolutely breaks the game once you unlock that move. So I don't really know. Maybe, maybe uh, Laylee's in a terrible accident at the beginning of the game. And she loses her wings. I don't know. Uh, but thank you for the calls. And uh, thank you, Platonic, for teasing something concretely. And then not just being pure bullshit rumors that we spend most of the podcast talking about. Sea of Thieves, Cameron. Uh, let's let's get into the Sea of Thieves content that they, they teased right before we went live. Oh, on our recording here. Uh, Remember when this was going to be a 30-minute episode, huh? <laughs> that was before the Star Fox rumor, Cameron. That was before the Star Fox. I was like, oh, we'll just talk about, oh, Platonic might be working on something. Oh, well, Sea of Thieves has this vague content coming out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, and then, I don't know, Reddit had to go make up a Star Fox rumor, and, and suddenly everybody wanted to talk about that. <laughs> Got to give the people what they want. So the Hungering Deep. The Hungering Deep. So people, when Sea of Thieves came out, the critics were like, this is all? This is all you do? You just sail around and you find treasure and you fight skeletons? They fart. They farted. And I don't know why they would fart in their game review. Very unprofessional and very unsanitary considering the wetness. But, yes. So... The, the plan for Sea of Thieves, and I said it in our Sea of Thieves first impressions that I did with Nick, that I, I, I gathered that 
everything they had planned for Sea of Thieves, because they had to get the game out in March, that, that the plan was we're, they're going to do a slow rollout of content. And so that's what we are getting. And they, a couple weeks back, Rare released a timetable, a timeline of when we're going to be getting content throughout the year. There's going to be weekly events throughout the year, but there's also going to be three uh, big updates to the game. And those are called The Hungering Deep, Cursed Sails, and Forsaken Shores. All right? So The Hungering Deep is coming next, and it's coming really soon. May 29th is when it's coming. Uh, Right when Arrested Development Season 5 is premiering. What are you doing to me, Rare? God damn it! Like, I'm... Here I am all excited about eight new episodes of Arrested Development because they're splitting the season into two yeah, parts. Yeah, they're, they're pulling a Voltron on that one. Well, it's fine because uh, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt premieres May 30th. And I was already, like, lamenting that because I'm a big fan of that show. I'm a big fan of Tina Fey and uh, her creative team on that show. And I was like, oh, so I get Arrested Development and Kimmy Schmidt back to back. on Like, that's just too much. And now Sea of Thieves has this big update dropping at the exact same time. And it's also right before E3 when I'm super busy with DK Vine prep and my workload is insane. So you know what? Fuck you, the entire planet Earth. You're all conspiring against me. Gah! All right. So Hungry and Deep. Cameron, what is the Hungry and Deep? Well, that's the thing. We don't that's know. the question, isn't it? <laughs> um... And they're super vague about it. They just released a trailer about The Hungering Deep. And so so the the big rumor about The Hungering Deep, or it's not even a rumor, it's been assumptions, is um, The Hungering Deep was going to introduce a new race of mermaids, or, or maybe a more evolved or less evolved race of mermaids than the ones who save your ass when you fall overboard or you need to get back to a new ship. At uh, least that, that, that was, was the thinking quite a while ago. They've released some new hints since then that kind of contradict that. Yeah, and uh, this was a very lore-heavy trailer. I was surprised uh, how how much this got into the the general like backstory of the Sea of Thieves. But um, it, I'm just going to say this right off the bat: Did it feel a little bit strange to finally see one of these pirates talk? Like, with actual yeah. mouth movements? A, a little bit, yeah. Uh, like, not and, weird as in bad, what, just I've been so... I've been acclimated to them not doing that. Yeah. Th- so, th- this was an elderly pirate narrating this. I, his name was Merrick? Or something? Like, Merrick Garland? The guy who Obama nominated for the Supreme Court? But uh, Mitch McConnell refused to uh, even, even have... Uh, uh, confirmation process and therefore uh he became a pirate instead uh so yeah that, that's that's my take on why he's named merrick poor merrick garland uh but merrick uh, sits sits here in this trailer and basically tells you a tale of the the people the the ancient denizens of the sea of thieves and how they would like worship gods and and they would conjure up like beast from the deeps or something. It, it's super vague, and they're trying to be purposely vague about this. They've updated their uh, Twitter uh, banner, uh, the, the header image on Twitter, about um, for, for the Sea of Thieves account, and it seems to be some sort of like prehistoric beast. That, that seems to be the general vibe. Like It's kind of expositing that the Sea of Thieves, or at least this particular corner of it, is or was home to these massive possibly prehistoric sea creatures that were just monstrous and destructive and somehow people were able to work together to use them to their advantage or get away Mm -hmm. yeah and so what this this has basically been pitched by people like Mike Chapman as a new uh, and Joe Need as like a new AI threat in Sea of Thieves, and 
the impression I get is this is going to be a permanent fixture in the game, but there's also going to be a, a week, uh, like a timed event with the rollout of the game as well. So, like, a, a limited edition like, mo uh, event or campaign in the game, but with lingering effects on the game world. So, I don't know. Something that's also probably worth mentioning is this. In the lead-up to the, the Hungry and Deep Ant uh, uh, news rollout, um, Rare added some additional content to the game in the form of Easter eggs that may have something to do with it. Um, there was a lot of, like, coy teasing on Twitter about these, but um, specifically it was the addition of um, a rock painting um Kind of in the model of uh, like with a monstrous shark coming up from the water, kind of similar to a the poster of a certain Spielberg movie. Um, there's a downed ship um, that has was christened with a nameplate, um, the killer whale, which means orca, and uh, it, it, it's Jaws. It 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 they're Jaws jokes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I thought I thought it was going to be Re Ready Player One. That Spielberg classic. I don't know. It probably got good reviews. It looked like shit to me. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah. So th what I, I thought because you know we were talking a lot about the lore book Tales from the Sea of Thieves uh, a few episodes back, and we were we we both like just absolutely adore that book and. They got into a lot about the mermaid culture in that book. So I think here in the Hungering Deep, we were like mermaids or like cannibal mermaids or something. Like I thought this is when we were going to start getting into the mermaid. But this seems to be a little bit more, uh, I don't want to say dry, but it seems like it's just going to be a little bit more of a, a new monstrous threat in the form of the Kraken. Uh, so, like, the the deeper dives into the lore of the game will have to come later. This is going to be just the introduction to new content and also campaigns and weekly events in the form of this new AI threat with, with some additional backstory and lore to it. Which, you know, I'm excited about, but I think the big updates that are really going to get people, really going to float people's boats so to speak, are going to be the Cursed Sails and the Forsaken Shores, especially when we get the whole new area in the game, the whole the, the fourth area in the game uh, alongside the Wilds, the Shores of Plenty, and the Ancient Isles. So the, the Devil Shroud is going to uh, roll back a little bit, and we're going to get this whole new uh, sector in the game. What, is that going to be in Forsaken Shores, I think? Um, I really don't know. Um, so, so hi, I'm curious. As someone who notoriously has a reputation for being shark bait, um, how do you feel that the first major content update is more sea creatures that munch on you? I've never been taken out by a kraken thus far, so I, I think it's just sharks themselves, like like the basic, the, the normal size sharks that are the bane of my existence in Sea of Thieves. I'm not really afraid of whatever this is. And I, I think, you know, there's going to there's gonna have to be camaraderie here to take these things out or, or to utilize them. I, I don't know what it, the scenario is going to be, but I mean, there, There's some safety speculation on what kind of creature this is. Like, it, like it's not shown too clearly. Um, like, it, it's shown in the trailer in the form of cave animated rock paintings and uh rare put up a little like tease of it on their on their social media header um like I, i've seen speculation it's a sea monster it's a megalodon um clanker it's cl it, it, it's clanker before he becomes mechanical you heard it here first folks wouldn't that be great if Clanker was the game that made this definitively DKU? Like, he was the first character who who unambiguously made it into the game. Well, not, Like, everybody was thinking, well, thinking not, it was going to be not, Black Eye, or... It, it wouldn't be so great for Clanker, but uh, that's par for the course for the life of Clanker. Well, if this is a prequel, we get to see 
how Clanker was fundamentally injured to the point where he had to be rebuilt into a cy- cybernetic trash munching life form. See, this is Gruntilda we're talking about. I don't think there was any had to about it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, personally, I, I, I was banking on TT first making his DKU, but I would be okay with Clanker too. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it. I'm excited about see, have more content. And, you know, Polygon, who they, they were lukewarm with the review, but they had a really good article the other day about Sea of Thieves, about how now that the initial hype has, has died off and the, the casuals who were sort of interested in the game but not enough to really stick around, now that they've kind of abandoned Sea of Thieves, the, the people who are actually playing the game played a lot more like rare intended people to play the game and and that that means like not everybody is just blo- as bloodthirsty as they were people are more likely to work together or or have just wacky shenanigans a lot more like it was in the technical alpha than it was when the game launched and so if if there this is a campaign where people will crews will have to work together then uh this is going to be really really good timing i'm glad they waited until late may to roll this out two months speaking of together there is something in that trailer that i that it just dawned on me that we haven't seen before what's that there were drums oh now unfortunately they're not bongo drums so i can't pan pan on the open sea yet but i know craig duncan craig you're a fan of donkey konga the original so Get me some bongo drums and see. <laughs> talk to Robin. Talk to Robin and the audio team. You guys can make it happen. I believe in you. Uh, also, we, really quick, we should point out that they finally added, or or they're. Tr- I, I I haven't really been uh up playing it in the last couple of days because I've been busy doing DK Vine stuff. But they they're they're attempting to add closed crews finally, where if somebody drops out. They're not going to be automatically replaced with a rando, and which is yeah. Um, addition. Thank, thankfully, yeah. Uh, this, this has been something that I I have kind of wanted, but never really thought about asking for. But it, it's really good, especially when somebody's connection drops, uh, or if you know somebody has to drop out, then you don't have to quit your session. You can just keep going. That. Uh, and they've, they've had problems implementing a lot of their updates this week. Uh, a lot, lot of uh, unforeseen bugs, but that, that's, that's a, a huge deal, especially for some, somebody like me who wants to play with friends but is not really keen on just being paired up with uh, some, some stranger. The most appealing part about it for me is that now you, if you want to have a crew with four of your friends, not all of you have to start at the same time. Like, um, oh, good point. Like, say, you know, one of your friends reaches out, hey, does anybody want to play Sea of Thieves? And you have to say, oh, I'd love to, but, you know, I'm recording an audio show about Star Fox rumors for the next <laughs> two hours. So you'll just, welcome, you'll just have Cameron. to sit on the menu screen and wait for me to show up. No, you don't have to do that anymore. They can just start playing without you and let you in when the time is right. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So it's great for us because I'm constantly doing that to you guys. Uh, this is, hey, 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 Cameron, you're up for the conversation this week. And you're just like, oh, fuck. Uh, all right. Well, that, that's Sea of Thieves. Uh, and expect a lot more discussion about the Hungering Deep when it drops on May 29th. All right. Really quick, we got some sad news to talk about. And I, I don't really want to... Um, go over this too much because it it is it is a blow uh nosy crow uh of course the Ch- uk children's storybook company the publisher uh award-winning they've released many uh very successful children's books and they've they've had penetration in the u.s market as well uh their app division which was uh headed by uh ed will Bryan and andrew james and they they released uh these really innovative and charming storybook apps, interactive storybooks that uh, you can, or more likely your your child can uh, influence, and it basically a hybridization of video games with storybooks. 
And relevant for DK Vine, there are two of them that we consider part of the Donkey Kong universe because of the inclusion of uh, a gold, a certain goldfish character that Ed Bryan created during his time at Rare. Unfortunately, uh, Nosy Crow has terminated their app division, and um, Ed, Will, Brian, and Andrew James were unfortunately laid off. And this sucks. Uh, there's, there's no way to get around it. It sucks, and the only bright side is the apps are still going to be available and sold from Nosy Crow. They're just not going to be developing new ones. So all of the fantastic storybooks that are available are still going to be available. So I, I know, you know, DK Viners, the, the long long time listeners and readers of the site, they're they're getting older, they're having kids. So I highly recommend these to anybody with with, with child or with enough of a childlike brain to appreciate them. They really are great. Uh, Goldilocks and the Little Bear, we did a whole episode about that at the end of season three, I think. And yeah. I, I on, on, ironically really highly recommend them, and I'm sure uh, these three guys, very talented, will all land on their feet in no time, so I, I have no worries about that, but it just sucks because they were doing a lot of great work for Nosy Crow, and I really do think this is the future of storybooks, and it's a shame that it might be something that's just a little bit too ahead of its time to really be profitable. Um in 2018 but yeah my my sentiments yeah, are pretty I, I similar hope more. um yeah i if if you like look at these i feel like it was a very like sort of charming way of bringing children's storybooks into a more modern age um like and like even just going besides the the fact that they look very charming cuz you know you have talented artists on this they did a lot of at least what I'd seen of them, there was a lot of, like, demonstration of technical cleverness on them. Like, um, I'll give the example of, like, you using the camera on your device as, like, to make an in-game mirror function and reflect your face back at you, or... Yeah! Or, like, the... Like, just using the hardware and the integration with the drawings very, very cleverly. Like, the way, like, Goldilocks's hair, like, bounced and animated. Or perspective trickery with things that kind of made this almost like a digital pop-up book. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I feel like there was, there was more that could have been said. And I think it's a huge shame that it didn't find an audience. Um, a comfort to take, I think, is that Ed... Will and Andrew are all spectacularly talented, as demonstrated by both this and all their previous works. I can't imagine, or at least I want to imagine, that they will be back on their feet very soon. And this is just a minor, unfortunate setback. Um, but right, and I, th- I, th- I think they should also be very proud of the work they did for Nosy Crow. And you know, once the sting of you know losing your job. <laughs> uh, kind of uh, passes and heals. Uh, they they really should you know l- look back on it with with fondness and pride because like I said ahead of its time and I I hope that you know in the future people will look back on these apps and say you know this this is one of the trailblazers to get you know books and uh, children's entertainment to where they are today. This is this, this is one of the stepping stones that got us to where we are now. So. Uh, yeah, like I said, check them out. They're, they are still available. They're going to be available for the foreseeable future. So that is the silver lining to all of this, that they're, all of their hard work is not lost. And uh, you can still download Fairy Tale Theater, which is also DKU. So, <laughs> um, All right, uh, to something a little bit more positive, uh, Diddy Kong might be in Mario Tennis Aces after all. So in Japan, there is a uh, some store or something that's doing a pre-order offer, and you can get a bag, a, a tote, if you pre-order the game at this store. And it has all the character emblems from the game on the tote bag. And one of these character emblems is a red shirt color with yellow stars. 
which pr is pretty much uh, a confirmation that Diddy Kong will be unlockable somewhere in the game, along with Birdo and Paratroopa. They're also featured on this bag. So unless this is just one of those weird scenarios where... I, I remember when Mario Kart 8 came out, there was uh, something, some sort of uh, review or ad or something somewhere that said Diddy Kong was in it, and that was just completely I wrong. I think it was a Latin American Nintendo magazine that was just okay. going off of assumed info because, yes, of course Diddy Kong's going to be in Mario Kart 8. It would just be silly yeah, if he yeah. wasn't. So, I mean, especially if they had just two opportunities wrong, which I him. very much doubt it is considering these character emblems would have to come from somewhere. Maybe Diddy was planned for it and then he got cut, but the, uh, the assumption... The only assumption we can make is that Diddy Kong, along with Birdo and Paratroopa, are three unlockable characters in Mario Tennis Aces. Which, you know, I, I said when they announced Mario Tennis Aces and it didn't look like Diddy Kong was in the game, that, you know, Nintendo was shying away from utilizing the Kongs in Mario games, aside from Donkey Kong himself, because they, they wanted to fully build up the Donkey Kong IP, rather than it being assumed that it's just part of the Mario franchise. Uh, I still stand by that. That is what my sources have told me. But if anybody's going to use Diddy Kong or find a way to use Diddy Kong, it's Camelot. Which, Camelot, I love Camelot. And Camelot has been on the record as being big Donkey Kong fans. They're the first ones who used the, uh, Diddy Kong after Rare was bought by Microsoft. They, they were the first people to use Diddy Kong aside from Rare. So I think that, you know... They, they would push for Diddy Kong, and they would get Diddy Kong in above any other people. So It also it's, makes it's sense here because, you know, tennis doubles. Tennis doubles, right. Donkey Kong needs a doubles partner. And so I could see them making the case, hey, we need Diddy Kong. We need Diddy Kong. And, but, and maybe Nintendo would be like, okay, but he's got to be unlockable. And I was like, okay. So I hope he's in it because... Uh, now that I have a Switch, I'm really looking forward to Mario Tennis Aces. Everything I see about this game looks like it's a return to that Camelot magic. And Diddy Kong's my favorite character of all time. So, yes, absolutely. Yeah. I'm not going to complain if he's in the game. As, as disappointed as I was not to see him in Mario Kart 8 the two times it was released, um, <laughs> I will be happy if that game is proven to be the outlier and Diddy Kong does continue to show up in other games because, you know, I just like playing as Diddy Kong. Right. Uh, like I said, I, 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 I'm kind of in the middle here where, you know, I'm, there, there's two extremes. There's I want the Kongs in all of these Mario sports and competition titles because it might be our only chance to play as them for this year, the next year or whatever. Uh, and I just want him represented, or I want Dixie represented, or I want K. Roll represented, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then the other extreme is, I don't want the Kongs in any Mario game because then they're going to be thought of as Mario characters, and it just hurts our franchise. I'm in the middle. I, I see both points of view. I don't think it should be as excessive as it was in a buyout era, but I don't see the harm in Diddy Kong appearing more than he does. And I would like to see Dixie Kong be in a Mario Kart game. That would be great. So... Hey, I love Camelot. I'm looking forward to Mario Tennis Aces. I, I I'm completely on board if Diddy's there. That's fine. I I'll play I'll play as him exclusively once I unlock him. So, uh, and then finally the last news story. It's a pretty minor news story. Nintendo has a new president. Not really relevant to DK Vine. Obviously, the Nosy Crow stuff was more important. <laughs> So. It, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to be flippant it, here, but it, it, it did kind of amuse me or bemuse me that the day this was announced, I completely ignored it. And I ran a news story on DK Vine about the Nosy Crow layoffs. And, I, I, and, then, and then I found out Nintendo had a new president. And I was like, that seems about right. Like, I, I'm sorry, but I, I know people think of us as a Donkey Kong website and therefore a Nintendo website. But the f Ed Bryan's current, um, like career at, at, like the state of his employment is a lot more relevant to my vision for dk vine than nintendo having a new press i'd say it's at least in our from our perspective just it's a hard story to treat like a big deal just because it's it's relevant but it's not 
perceptively relevant right this moment. Um, yeah. Because we really don't know what the new president means for this company for from our perspective we know that nosy crow shuttering its app division means no more storybook games for us um nintendo getting a new president um unless he like in unless the first thing he did when he became president was publicly say get donkey kong the hell out of here then <laughs> <laughs> then um or alternatively i demand 50 new donkey kong games um <laughs> <laughs> um, there's not really a terrible amount for us to go on right now in regards yeah, to this it, decision it, we it i feel be, like i just like, don't know enough to comment meaning it would be like me replacing phil spencer as the head of uh xbox and be like you know what i want i want a nine part chief Lotusen series <laughs> as i smoke as i smoke my dank donkey kong weed uh yeah you see that, that's the thing like we DK Vine, we're, we're full of uh, interesting and diverse staff members with, with with a wide taste in video games. But yeah, DK we, Vine, we come itself, in various shades of male and white. <laughs> oh, look, I, I I want to change that. I do. It just it, it it just it's not like we can pay any money to our staff. So therefore, it's not like. We can go on a big hiring spree, so it's, it's basically all volunteers. I, I'm so. not taking you to task. I'm just lampshading the obvious. Yeah, okay, okay. But I'm saying our taste, at the very least, but besides the, the the middle of the Venn diagram where we all love Rare and the Donkey Kong universe, we, we have different tastes in games, but DK Vine itself, our mission statement, yeah, the, the new Nintendo president doesn't immediately affect that, so therefore it's not going to be a huge story for us. Okay, that being said, what do we know about the new Nintendo president? Well, now that Nintendo has stabilized from the financial ruin that it found itself in during the Wii U era, uh, Tatsumi Kimishima, Kimishima, uh, he has stepped aside, which he always kind of implied he would. He took the role following uh, Iwata's untimely passing, and... He never had any designs on being in that role for longer than a couple years. So the new president is, oh god, Sh- Shantaro F- F- Furukawa? F- F- Furukawa? This is another reason we don't do hour long episodes on presidential transfers in Nintendo because we will butcher the hell out of their names. Yeah, it, it took me a long time to get the hang of Iwata. So, uh, anyway, uh,. Shantaro Furukawa, who I'm just going to refer to as the new Nintendo president until I get clarification on that pronunciation, he officially takes over on June 28th, which I assume is just so he doesn't have to go out to E3. (laughs) Fucking slacker. Right from the start. Uh, But the only thing we really, I really know about him, because I I, I perused some of the news stories about him to kind of get a sense of who is this guy. Because you're right, Cameron, he could say, no more new Donkey Kong games. You know what I hate? I hate Donkey Kong. I like everything else with Nintendo. Give me 30 Fire Emblem games. And then he gives the the Greg Mail's double finger to Donkey Kong. (laughs) Uh, No, he, he apparently really likes the indie golfing RPG golf story. Which... If, if you don't know what Golf Story is, and I didn't know what Golf Story was because it doesn't have Donkey Kong in it. I looked it up. This is apparently a lot like Camelot's two handheld Mario Golf RPGs. Uh, Mario Golf, parentheses, Game Boy Color, and Mario Golf Advance Tour for the Game Boy Advance. So, obviously, those games are beloved by the DK Vine staff. And... If the new president of Nintendo loves a game clearly inspired by those, that that tells me that Camelot is about to get paid by the new Nintendo president to have a return to form. We're going to get the return of Kid. We're going to get the return of Joe. All of those classic beloved characters. We're going to catch up with them. Last we saw Kid, he had suffered a career-ending injury and was a despondent has been. So I can't wait to see what 10 years has done to that guy. Gonna be fun. He's also apparently fluent in English, Cameron. So 
you know what? I'm, I'm gonna make the pitch right now. I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling jaunty. You know, I was, I'm inspired by Rare and the fact that they boldly announced Banjo Tooie at the end of Banjo Kazooie. So I'm going to make an announcement right now. I am going to get the president of Nintendo on the conversation. You know, next year is DK Vine's 20th anniversary, but it's also the 20th anniversary of Mario Golf parentheses Game Boy Color. Here, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give up on getting Fabio on the conversation. It's not going to happen. He's too busy buttering his nips with I Can't Believe It's Not Butter to ever appear on our show. That's fine. Fabio, you're yesterday's news, buddy. Get out of here. I'm going to get the new president of Nintendo on the spotlight episode for Mario Golf Game Boy Color on the conversation next year. You heard it here first, folks. (coughs) This has been a File 2 production. Qué rico.